So today's lecture is about both some existing algorithms as well as some strategies for creating some new algorithms. If there isn't an algorithm already out there, that's also the problem that you need to solve. So let's jump into it. So what we're going to be doing today is we're going to talk about how we're going to represent algorithms. Uh, spoiler alert, it's going to be using pseudocode. I'm going to go through an example, insertion sort, uh, which will introduce you to a useful algorithm that's commonly used in computer science for, so for sorting small lists. And then we'll talk about three algorithm strategies. Um, there's about five or six algorithm strategies in total, but we're going to uh, show you these three strategies for now that are used actually to solve many, many problems that you're going to encounter not just in this class, but also in the data structures class and also in the algorithms class in the future. So each one of these strategies has a corresponding algorithm that we're going to use as an example. Uh, so that'll help uh, hopefully uh, you understand how the principles work. So first of all, what is an algorithm? Well, a lot of people confuse what an algorithm is and they, they confuse it with a program. Um, an algorithm actually isn't necessarily something that's specifically computer related. So that's definitely not true. And in fact, um, the name algorithm comes from uh, a, a fellow named Al Khwarizmi um, back in the Middle Ages, and uh, it was a very old concept prior to any computers. But the idea of an algorithm describes basically the steps to solve some problem. So we can use these in our daily lives, but obviously we're going to focus on the types of algorithms that we use to solve problems using a computer. So um, talking about modern algorithm development, not to, uh, to diminish the contribution of Al Khwarizmi, but um, the, uh, the modern development of algorithms specifically focused on computers uh, began in the 30s and 40s. Um, and actually a significant amount of the work uh, focused on algorithms we really haven't learned that much new um, from between the 1930s and the 1970s. Since then, there hasn't been whole lot of progress being made that's going to affect the daily lives of uh, average uh, computer science undergraduates or graduates. But the work anyway was uh, carried out first by Kurt Gödel uh, and uh, then Alonzo Church and Alan Turing. These two names have been mentioned before, uh, Alonzo Church um, in the US camp and Alan Turing in the UK camp, um, developing algorithms specifically for computers, whereas Kurt Gödel um, developed more of a mathematical model uh, for an algorithm. So one of the things that Alonzo Church and Alan Turing have done is they've talked about the theoretical aspects of algorithms, which is actually a pretty challenging topic. So we'll introduce it, uh, but we won't talk about it uh, a ton in this class. That'll be something that you'll focus on again, uh, probably in a third year algorithms class. But Alonzo Church um, developed Lambda Calculus, which can be used to talk about algorithms, in particular about functions. And Alan Turing introduced the idea of a Turing machine, uh, which can also be used to prove things about algorithms. Uh, performance, uh, how much expressibility, uh, can, uh, computers, how, much, how many problems can we solve, that sort of thing uh, can be shown. Um, and Alonzo Church and Turing both kind of independently uh, develop these same ideas. All right, so an algorithm is a strategy basically for solving a problem. So somebody just tells you how to solve a problem, they could be uh, giving you an algorithm, but there's certain criteria that we need uh, in order to implement an algorithm. So we usually follow these three uh, properties. So first of all, the process must eventually terminate. So if you think about an operating system, for instance, um, hypothetically, an operating system can run indefinitely. So I wouldn't consider the operating system to be a single algorithm. It could be doing things that are algorithmic in nature. It could be following an algorithm to solve a specific problem tempor uh, temporarily, uh, and then it goes back to its regular behavior. But overall, the operating system itself is not an algorithm. So software usually uses algorithms, but an algorithm is just a part of what makes up a piece of software. The steps in that strategy must be finite. Okay, not only that, they must be unambiguous. So for example, you can't say uh, things like, 
um, you know, find this, uh, this optimal uh, set of numbers from this infinite set. Because the set is infinite, we can't examine all the numbers. And that step is, first of all, not a finite step. But also it's not unambiguous because we haven't described exactly how we're supposed to do that. So we need really detailed steps in order to define an algorithm. So it's useless to come up with an algorithm that kind of vaguely describes how to solve the problem. We need an algorithm that is very, very specific about it. Um, in particular, because we want to write some code to actually do this, we need to be able to take the algorithm and turn it into code. So let's talk a little bit about how we're going to represent algorithms. So imagine you come up with a new algorithm and you want to share it with the world. So uh, this is we're going to talk about some of the ways that we can represent it. Just before we go on, I just want to talk about here's one way that an algorithm is represented and something that maybe you don't know necessarily that it is, in fact, an algorithm. But here's an algorithm. And actually, you've seen some instructions kind of like this if you've ever assembled any furniture from some of the big box stores. Uh, assembling furniture usually comes with a diagram. This is an origami diagram, so it's a little bit different. Uh, but the steps for putting together a dresser aren't really that different. Uh, just sort of diagrams that show you, you know, where to insert various bolts and, and, and so on, how to attach these pieces together. But this is an origami uh, description, and you can see that the steps are um, finite. Obviously, it's a matter of making a fold or two in between each step. And the steps are unambiguous. So the diagram, I think anyway, I'm not an origami expert, but I think that the diagram shown here shows you exactly what the end product should look like. And so if you, uh, if you know how to do that, that fold, uh, then it should be relatively straightforward for you to reproduce this bird. So this is an example of an algorithm. It's not the way that we're going to typically represent an algorithm for computer science. Uh, but it is an algorithm nevertheless. Another example of an algorithm you might not think uh, would be a recipe. A recipe has a set of finite steps that you're supposed to follow, and those steps ultimately lead to you developing some food uh, that's edible, hopefully, and you can um, follow those steps because the steps are finite and they're unambiguous. At least they're supposed to be. Okay. So let's think about how we can represent algorithms for solving pro, uh, computer science problems. Well, one idea is that we could just code it directly in some programming language. And I like to call this the first year student's favorite because uh, this is the one that seems to make sense. And back when I was a student, it made sense to me too. Why don't I just write the code? But let me just tell you, when I was a first year computer science student and I was thinking these thoughts, the programming language that we were using was called Turing. And of course, named after Alan Turing, but otherwise, you probably haven't heard this programming language before. Uh, if you have, anyway, I'm sorry. <laughs> it's, it's pretty old and, and kind of obsolete uh, programming language. And if I had written an algorithm, uh, like I didn't come up with any clever algorithms when I was in first year, but if I had written an amazing algorithm and documented it by writing it in the Turing programming language, it wouldn't be of much use to you right now. Uh, because you would have to first learn Turing programming language just to understand this algorithm so that you can implement it in whatever language you want to write it in. So it's, it's not that great. And, you know, programming languages over, over time, they, they kind of fall out of favor. And, you know, there are, uh, there's a constant supply of new programming languages. There are esoteric programming languages, uh, you know, uh, ones that are meant just to be funny. Uh, you know, for example, the PA programming language is literally just a painting and your, your painting is actually a, an executable uh, computer program. But there are also other more practical uh, programming languages. So recently, for example, uh, Google announced uh, Car the Carbon programming language to replace C++. And we've had other programming languages like Rust for the same purpose and Go and Dart and so on. These programming languages are constantly coming in. Um, they aren't necessarily in the mainstream just yet, uh, although we'll say that Dart and Go are both uh, making their way into the mainstream, it seems, uh, and as a result, very useful. But who knows what's going to happen 20 years from now. We have a lot of programming languages that are still hanging around from decades and decades ago. Uh, an example, C++ has been around for a very long time, and I learned it as an undergraduate student. I'm really old, so that means it's been around for a super long time. It's still in the top three programming languages used by industry. 
And similarly, JavaScript is also quite old and it's existed since around the time I was an undergraduate student as well. There are also some programming languages that are kind of weird. Uh, as an example, um, back when I was an undergraduate student, I used the programming language Miranda, which I'm certain very few people have heard about. Um, and so Miranda was one of the languages that I learned as an undergrad. It's a functional programming language, uh, similar to Haskell or Scheme or Lisp. And uh, as a result, it, it doesn't translate particularly well to non-functional programming languages. So if you know Python and I show you an algorithm that was written in Miranda, uh, you're going to have a really difficult time uh, translating it over to that other programming language. So that's not such a great idea. It is the best idea of, of the, the suggestions that I'm going to project today, uh, for sure, but it's not a great idea. So another way is we could do is a flowchart. And again, I'm going to apologize if you learned about flowcharts in high school, I'm going to apologize because flowcharts have effectively gone away. We don't really use them. Uh, industry doesn't really use flowcharts anymore. Um, one of the, the flaws with the flowchart, <clears throat> if you don't know what a flowchart is, by the way, a flowchart looks like this, where we have these, this diagram. And, uh, the different shapes represent different things that we could do. So, for example, the rectangle represents something that we can we can accomplish. So, uh, we'll set a variable, we'll update some sum or whatever. Uh, a diamond represents a check where we're going to test if some condition is true, and if it's true, we go in one direction. If it's false, we go in another direction. Um, but as you can see, they're quite large. Like this is a really small. This is basically an if statement, and it takes up half of the vertical space on um, the slide. So it's not a really great way to represent an algorithm because your typical algorithm will be gigantic. Uh, we'll need like a poster in order to have this algorithm handy for us to implement. And so it's not the greatest and they are quite uh, difficult to create. Obviously we have electronic tools that we can use for creating uh, diagrams these days, but even so it's kind of tedious. So what we really want is something text-based, but not some potentially uh, programming language that potentially could fall out of favor. So the third option then is to just write it in some kind of a programming language like notation that's used to represent an algorithm and has some of the same programming constructs that programming languages tend to have, for loops and if statements and functions, um, but it's not actually a programming language, so it's going to remain constant. It's not going to have some special syntactic sugar like Python has, kind of unique to Python and as a result uh, other programming languages uh, people who were write programs in other programming languages won't necessarily know how to take that Python code and turn it into their programming language this is a generic programming language like uh, notation and it's very easy to turn it into Python and then if you're an expert at Python then you can use some of that syntactic sugar to make the program a, a little bit more efficient or a little bit more compact or a little bit more elegant uh, as you see fit. So here's an example of uh, some pseudocode. And it looks a lot like a programming language. Uh, it's got some weird things because uh, pseudocode has been around for a long time. So it has some very Pascal-like syntax. Uh, and, you know, it's kind of Fortran-like syntax. So the for loop is in kind of a weird uh, notation. You can see that all the lines are numbered on the left-hand side. Uh, the function actually has a dash in it, which isn't really permitted in uh, most uh, variable and function names in modern programming languages. You can also see that when you have certain arguments, sometimes they're passed in as capital letters, and the function name is also all caps. So it's very um, a bit outdated, and perhaps we could you know update the, <laughs> the pseudocode notation from the 1960s and 70s when it was developed, but uh, it is pretty consistent. And actually, it's quite easy to go through the seven line program and convert it into whatever programming language that you want. And of course, we'll do that in the demo uh, next week. And that will be a good opportunity for us to take pseudocode and convert it into Python code. And I'll show you how easy it is to do. There's one thing that kind of annoys me that is, again, another lingering thing from kind of an old-fashioned uh, programming idea is in early programming languages, some of them used indexing that was one-based. So in other words, the first index in an array was one. And that's very strange today. Not very many programming languages use that. Most programming languages start counting at zero. But in 
pseudocode unfortunately starts counting at one. Now some people just break the rules and then they just write their pseudocode so that it starts counting at zero. Uh, but the reason why I'm not doing that, I would, the, I really feel the urge to do that. Uh, the reason why I'm not doing that is because when you read a, a, a textbook on data structures and algorithms, um, they will usually consistently use this notation. And by the way, this notation comes directly from uh, probably the most famous algorithms book that there is, and it's used in most algorithms courses as a textbook. Uh, and it's the, the Corman and Lyserson, uh, I think it's called Fundamentals of Algorithms. I don't happen to have it handy right now, um, but it's a very useful book. And, uh, and it, it's been around for a long time, many editions, but the the pseudocode has remained the same syntax. So I literally took this syntax exactly from that book as is. So later on, when you inevitably are reading that book for a much more difficult course, you're familiar with this pseudocode notation. All right, so now that we know how we're gonna represent our algorithms, uh, let's go in and start looking at an algorithm. So the first algorithm we're gonna look at is called insertion sort. So probably you're like a lot of students that come into computer science from a high school and they've had a high school teacher who was really enthusiastic and maybe they taught a Turing programming language or maybe they taught flow charts or another favorite of high school computer science teachers is the bubble sort algorithm. And as a result, a lot of that enthusiasm rubs off onto students and students are very excited about the bubble sort algorithm. I'm here to contend that the insertion sort algorithm is a much better alternative to the bubble sort algorithm. Uh, it's not any more efficient. Uh, as far as efficiency goes, they're about the same. But the insertion sort as a concept is much easier to understand. And as a result, there's a certain elegance to the simplicity of this algorithm. It's very easy to describe how this algorithm works. Uh, and that's, of course, why we're going to use it as our first algorithm here today. Uh, insertion sort and bubble sort are really bad sorts in terms of performance for really large lists, but it's really a great sort for a small list. So if you have a small list, insertion sort is great. So if you have 100 elements or less, insertion sort will really perform amazingly. If you have a million elements or a billion elements, you're probably going to want to use some other kind of sort because this will be impractical. All right, so let's move on. So we have a lot of sorting algorithms in computer science. You could easily say too many. There's just a list of four here, but there are many, many sorting algorithms. And just like with, I was mentioning the esoteric uh, programming languages, there are also some esoteric sorting algorithms. Um, and uh, so for example, there's uh, Bogo sort. Bogo sort's an example of a, a sort, kind of a hilarious concept. And basically what happens is uh, you randomize the order of the list and then you check to see if it's sorted. And if it's not, repeat the process. <laughs> so it could take a really, really long time to sort a really big list because the probability of randomly ordering, reordering the list and having it come out as sorted is really low. Uh, but that was not meant as a serious sorting algorithm. It was meant as kind of a computer science joke, whether you find that funny or not. Um, but these are these algorithms here are all serious uh, sorting algorithms that computer scientists use on a regular basis. So I mentioned insertion sort is a really good sort for small lists. Uh, the other three, quick sort, merge sort, and heap sort, all have much better performance for larger lists. Um, and we'll uh, have a chance to um, to discuss quick sort and merge sort perhaps during the demo if if there's time. Uh, we'll see what happens. Um, heap sort will have to wait until a later course because you have to learn what a heap is before you can understand heap sort. And I think the heap will be introduced in either a data structures course or an algorithms course in your future. So at the same time, you can learn about the heap sort. It's pretty straightforward once you know what a heap is. Uh, we've got a lot of choices. And why do we have so many choices, you might wonder. Uh, well, the reason is there are a lot of nuances about each of these sorts that make uh, the choice not so easy in just choosing what is the best sorting algorithm. For a long time, uh, a lot of the public considered quicksort to be the absolute best sort, um, and there was no other contenders really. So it was that was the way that you sorted things. If you're out in industry, for example, you use quicksort. Well, quicksort has some properties that it's very efficient in the average case. But there are certain cases where quicksort actually breaks down to be just as slow as insertion sort. So for large lists, that's actually a really bad thing. 
Um, so Quicksort has kind of fallen out of favor. And the two sorts that have become uh, more favorite are Merge Sword and Heapsort. Now, technically, Quicksort is actually still faster than Merge Sword and Heapsort for your typical average, like, randomized lists. The lists are kind of in a random order. Quicksort will sort them the fastest of the three. But it's a pretty negligible difference between the three. And Merge Sword and Heapsort guarantee that even in the worst case scenario, even if the list is, for example, already sorted, where Quicksort performs terribly, uh, Merge Sword and Heapsort will still perform around at the same performance that they did for the kind of random order lists. So there are lots of different sorting algorithms and there's a lot of reasons for it. And there are more reasons even than I'm listing here um, that, that are important, but uh, those will be addressed probably at a later time. So let's just talk about one of these, the insertion sort algorithm. So the principle of insertion sort is we're gonna basically designate some part of the list as already sorted. So we'll start out as, um, uh, as some of the list is sorted, some of the list is unsorted. Now what we're going to do is we're going to take one element out of the unsorted part of the list and we're going to insert it into the proper place in the sorted part of the, of the list. And then we move on to the next element in the unsorted part and eventually we're going to run out of elements in the unsorted part and the sorted part of the list, having grown by one element with each iteration, will now comprise the entire list. So in other words, the entire list will now be sorted. Before we can get started though, a uh, question I want you to consider is, does a list with one element need to be sorted? Hopefully you're able to determine that it doesn't, right? One element has no other orders it can possibly be in. Uh, and so at the very beginning, we're gonna start with our sorted part of the list. It's gonna be one element large. Okay, and then we grab the next element from the unsorted part of the list, and we either insert it before or after that element, depending on what the order of the element is. I'm going to show you an animation uh, that will show that will uh, describe that process, um, so that you can see how it works. And there are variations where you know maybe the sorted part of the list is at the beginning, or the sorted part of the list is at the end, and of course you can sort in ascending and descending order. There are a couple of different variations of this, but the principle is basically the same. We take a value that's not sorted and we put it into the sorted part of the list where it's supposed to go. And as long as you keep doing that, eventually the list becomes sorted. So you can literally describe this sort in one sentence, which is one of the things that makes this such a good computer science topic. So here's an example for insertion sort. We don't have that many elements in the list. Uh, but we have just a few elements and what we're going to do is use insertion sort to one at a time add all the values that are not sorted into the sorted part of the list. So as usual when we're doing insertion sort we always assume that the first element is always sorted. So the five in this case there's no other way that we can order just the five by itself so we call the five part of the list already sorted. So the next element to consider the first element the unsorted part is this one. So we're going to take the one out and if the one, uh, sorry, if the five, uh, the element in the sorted part of the list is greater than the one, we shift it over by one position. You can see that we've done that and it's the only sorted value. So we only had to do this for just one element. And now there's this empty space at the beginning of the list. That's where we place the one that we took out. This is our separate key variable that we saw in the pseudocode. So we're going to repeat the process. We're going to take the three out and we're going to ask ourselves, well, is the 5 greater than the 3? If it is, we're going to move it over to the right. And it is. So we move it over to the right. Now we're going to ask ourselves the same question about the 1. Is the 1 greater than the 3? And it's not. Because it's not greater than the 3, then we stop. We stop right here. And that's that hole right there is where we're going to put the 3. So repeating the process, we take the 2 out. We move over the 5 because it's greater. We move over the three because it's greater. We don't move over the one. So we put the two in the empty hole where the three used to be. Now for the four, same thing. We move over the five because it's greater. Now the three is not greater. We don't need to examine the two or the one because this is in sorted order. So we can stop and insert the value where the five once was. Here's an example where the list is already sorted. So let's see what happens in this case. So the one now is the already sorted element. 
So we're going to take the 2 out, we'll move all the greater elements over, there aren't any, so we just put the 2 right back where we found it. We move all the greater elements than the 3 over, there aren't any. We move all the elements greater than the 4, there aren't any. We move all the elements greater than the 5, there aren't any. So we kind of had to do a, a minimal amount of work here because it just so happened that all the values were already in the right order. So we do take the value out of the list and put it right back. But when we check to see if there are any greater elements, we only have to check one element. So for the 2, we only have to check the 1. For the 3, we only have to check the 2. For the 4, we only have to check the 3. And the 5, we only have to check the 4. Because we know the sorted list is in order, that's all we needed to do. And we could stop without checking the other elements in the sorted part of the list. So it's actually pretty efficient when the list is already sorted. All right, so here's another example where we have a small list. But in this case, you can see that the list is sorted in reverse order. Now, search and sort can still handle this, but it's going to maximize the amount of work that it has to do. So as usual, the 5 is considered sorted. So we take the 4 out. The 5 shifts over because it's greater than the 4. The 3 gets taken out. The 5 gets shifted over because it's greater than 3. The 4 gets shifted over because it's greater than the 3. And we insert the 3. You can see that we had to move all the elements over. Now the 2, we move the 5 over because it's greater than 2. We move the 4 over because it's greater than 2. We move the 3 over because it's greater than 2. And we insert the 2 at the beginning of the list. The process is very similar for the 1. We move over the 5 because it's greater than 1. We move over the 4 because it's greater than 1. We move over the 3. And we move over the 2. And again, the 1 gets inserted at the beginning of the list. Okay, so it still worked, but it involved the maximum amount of work that we possibly could have done. Just for the sake of completeness, I'm going to show you a larger example um, so we can see how it works with kind of a randomized value. Uh, randomized set of values. So we're going to consider the 18 to be already sorted. Take the minus 2 out. The 18 is greater, so we move it over. We're going to put the negative 2 in its place. The next element to consider is the 4. The 18 is greater than the 4, but the negative 2 is not, so we insert the 4 in the empty space. 21. None of the elements are greater, so we just put the 21 right back. The 6 gets taken out. 21 is greater, so it moves over. The 18 is greater. So it moves over, and we put the 6 in the eight spot. Okay, then we take out the 1. 21 is greater than the 1, so we move it over. The 18 is greater than the 1, so we move it over. So is the 6, we move it over. And so is the 4, so we move it over. The negative 2 is not greater than the 1, so we leave it in place. We put the 1 in the second position. 17. The 21 is greater than the 17, and the 18 is greater than the 17. And then we put that in the position because the 6 is not greater. Now the 21 is greater than the 11, the 18 is greater than the 11, the 17 is greater than the 11, but the 6 is not, so we insert the 11 in that spot. And finally the 3, the 21 is greater than the 3, the 18 is greater than the 3. The 17 is greater than the 3. The 11 is greater than the 3. The 6 is greater, so we move it over. And the 4 is also greater, so we move it over. And we insert the 3 because the 1 is not greater than the 3. So this can handle lists of any size. just involves a lot of work when the list grows larger. All right, so the algorithm that we just considered in cert sort uh, has this pseudocode, and I've shown you this briefly before, but we didn't go through it. Uh, let's quickly um, learn a little bit about how this algorithm works. So yeah, we just give it any name. You can see that it takes one argument, which is just A. Uh, that's our list. And this is a sort that's called an in-place sort, which means that we're not going to make a copy of the array that's sorted. We're actually going to modify the original array. And sorting algorithms can be divided into two categories, one where they do in-place sort and one where they do out-of-place sort. Out-of-place creates a duplicate of the array, except that the duplicate has been sorted. 
uh, an insertion sort is in place. So it, because it sorts in place, it uses less space, but it's also kind of destructive in that it actually changes uh, the list and we don't have the original unsorted list anymore. Sometimes we might need that. Now, a lot of times an algorithm can be written in both ways. So we can write a sorting algorithm and we can make an in-place version of it or an out-of-place version of it. Um, sometimes that's challenging to do and sometimes it's not. But this is an in-place version of insertion sort. And you can see that it's got two for loops. And this is going to be important uh, when we're thinking about this algorithm because part of what we're going to be doing today is not just uh, learning about the algorithm, learning about how to solve this sorting problem, I want you to start thinking about algorithms more generally. I want you to think about whether or not an algorithm is a good thing or not. So I'm going to tell you right now that uh, although I think insertion sort is actually a really efficient algorithm uh, and to, to explain to students in terms of how much time it takes to sort a large list of numbers, we're gonna see that it's not particularly efficient. So computationally efficient, well, it's not really, except for small lists. For small lists, it's actually quite good. And I'm gonna prove that uh, in a minute, but for now, let's just examine the code and how does it work. So I mentioned that we're gonna have a sorted part of the list and an unsorted part of the list. And this first for loop is basically talking about how that sorted part of the list is going to go from just having one element in it until it gets to the point where it has all of the elements of the list in it. And that's what this for loop here is. So this for loop is kind of a weird syntax because you haven't seen pseudocode before necessarily, but this is basically saying that I want to have a for loop that sets the value of this J variable from all the values between two and the length of A. So two, three, four, five, six, whatever, all the way up to the length of A. And because pseudocode uses one-based indexing, one is the first index of A, and length is the last index of A. So in zero-based indexing, the length of the list is actually not a valid index, uh, but it is in pseudocode. So I, I'm, this is inclusive. So don't get confused. If you're familiar with Python and you're seeing a for loop that uses the range function, for instance, in this case, if I were to do something like range two comma len of A, that would not include the length of A. Uh, just that's a quirk of, of Python. In this case, pseudocode doesn't have that quirk. It literally takes on the values between two and the length of A. All right. This is the index of the, the first unsorted value in the list. And we start at two because we're going to assume that the very first element of the list is already sorted. That has to do with the previous slide where I asked if um, the uh, if a uh, one element list uh, is considered sorted and it is so we're going to consider the first element already sorted so we jump straight to the second element of the list j equals two and now we're going to do is we're going to take the element that's at j uh, or at index two in the first iteration and we're going to take it out so we're going to take that j value and we're going to put it into uh, we're going to take the value at index j rather and we're going to put it into a separate variable key that way the array now has an empty space i mean it's still has the same value in it, but we're eventually going to overwrite that value. Okay. Then what we're going to do is we're going to go through the sorted part of the uh, of the list, and we're going to move all the elements over that are larger than this key value. And because if they're larger, they need to be the right to the right of the value, right? And if they're smaller, they need to be the left of it. We're going to sort in increasing order. This is an increasing order version of insertion sort. And so what we're going to do is we're going to start at index i here, which is initially set to j minus 1. And then we're going to work our way backwards through the sorted part of the list. So we start at j minus 1 because we're not going to start at j. j is where the empty space is. We're going to start to the left of that empty space. And initially, there's only one element there. And all we're going to ask ourselves is, should I move that element over or not? So imagine, for example, the first element of the list is a three, and the second element, which is our, our index at index j, uh, is say a five. In that case, I don't want to move the first element over because the five belongs after. Okay, but imagine if the first element is a nine, and the second element is a five, then I do want to move the nine over. I want to move the nine to the right by one space, and then I want to insert the five to the left of that nine. 
So that's what this while loop does on the inside. It's going to start at j minus one, so immediately to the left of the very first uh, of the very first uh, <clears throat> of the first unsorted value. And I'm going to quit if I get to zero. If I get to zero, remember that we're one, we're counting starting one. So if we get to index zero, there's no element there. So we've reached the beginning of the list, so there's no more elements to move over. And we're also going to stop if the value that we find uh, is not greater than the key. And so, for example, if there's multiple values in the sort of part of the list, I only want to move the bigger elements over. Once I find no more bigger elements, because they're sorted, the first non-bigger element that I find is an indicator that all the rest of the elements to the left of that are all smaller than or equal to this key value that I want to insert. So this is where I should insert the key. So if I, I find another bigger value, and there actually is a valid index, and at that index there's a value that's bigger than the key, then what I do is I shift it over by one. So I move the AI value into the AI plus one position. Okay, so that moves it to the right by one. And then I decrease the I index to go one more position to the left. And check. I'm going to check now, see if that position is also has a greater value. Finally, when I exit that while loop, you can see the indentation here, much like in Python, is used to indicate what's part of the loop. Uh, finally, when I'm done, I take the key and I insert it into the empty space at I plus one, as in the array. And then now there's one more element in the sorted part of the list. So I increase the J index and go to the next unsorted value. And I just keep on doing that until I get to the end of the list. So it's important to note that there are two loops in here. One's a for loop and one's a while loop, but there are two loops uh, and they basically go through some portion of the list, each one does. And since they're embedded inside one another, we have the while loop within the for loop uh, that has some performance consequences that we're gonna try to evaluate. So during the demo, we're gonna write some code and I'm gonna show you how to use that code in order to determine to get some kind of an indication of its performance. So we're not going to get too formal, uh, too deep into theory here. Uh, but in the end, I've done this exercise before, and I have come up with this result. So what I did was I created a random array of different sizes. So I created an array that had you know 10 elements, and then I had an array that had a thousand elements and fifteen hundred elements and and so on all the way up to about ten thousand elements and I just measured how many operations did I perform and the operation that I was counting was how many times did I move an element so if we go back to the code right here you can see that on line five and on line seven I moved an element right so on line five I moved the element from position I to position i plus one and on line seven well kind of on line two and line seven together i take the value that was at position j and i move it into position i plus one whatever i plus one happens to be equal to at this point and so i move those values on those two lines of code and so all i did was keep a counter of how many times i moved an element and every single time i got to line five or line seven i incremented that counter by one and then when I was finally done, depending on the length of A, I just plotted how many uh, items were moved. And you can see that this is measured in millions. Okay, so this uh, scale here, not one swap, two swap. This is a million, two million, three million, four million. So if you look carefully here, you can see that this has a curve to it. Okay, so it's not a straight line. If it was a straight line, then um, you know, just you know, having a list that's twice the size would mean I have to do twice the work to sort it. Unfortunately, that's not a possibility. But in this case, you can see that it has a curve to it. Now, there are lots of uh, mathematical formulas that when you plot them, uh, will end up taking on a shape pretty similar to this. So it's hard from visual inspection to see what it is. You know, you might need some more theory in order to analyze it. Uh, but one of the things uh, this kind of looks at looks like to me is a parabola. It looks like it could be a parabola. And so in this case, this is, in fact, a parabola. And so we can come to the conclusion that insertion sort has 
Um, it's called quadratic performance because, of course, the parabola uh, is usually represented by x squared or whatever. In this case, we might say n squared because we have input size down here. We called it n uh, down at the bottom of the graph here. So n is how many elements are in the list. We usually have some kind of a measure of what the input size is. For sorting, it's usually the length of the list. And then we have how many operations we're going to perform. And in this case, that the performance is proportional to n squared. Okay, there might be some other factors. We're doing some other things uh, that you know, don't get counted maybe before we enter the for loop or whatever. Uh, so there's some constant amount of operations that are always part, no matter how long the list is. It doesn't, it isn't impacted by the length of the list. Uh, but the biggest thing, the biggest contributor to this number is the n squared expression. And it might be 2n squared or something like that. It might not just be n squared. But it doesn't really matter because it takes on the same shape. And as the input gets bigger, you can see the amount of work that we have to do gets a lot bigger. And this is kind of a problem, and the reason why insertion sort isn't really uh, super practical for big lists. I don't consider 10,000 elements to be uh, very big as far as lists go. <laughs> Wait till you take the big data class. You're going to have trillions of elements in your list. And of course, we can't do that. If we have a trillion elements in our list, or even if we have a billion elements in our list, um, n squared means that it's going to take a billion times a billion amount of work to do. Uh, and that's not really... Uh, very practical. So if we want to do this in a relatively short order, we need to have something more better performance than this. Anyway, so one of the things that we usually do is when we come up with an algorithm, we perform some kind of analysis on it. And you're going to do this in future classes. For now, I just wanted to give you a basic idea so you can get an idea of what this might look like. And all I did here was just something really naive. I just literally counted how many operations I performed. You could also literally time your program, you could execute the program and then literally count how many milliseconds it took to execute and you would get a graph pretty similar to this as well. It might be interrupted by things like, you know, your malware scanner decided it wanted to download some new updates and you got a bunch of text messages and Steam started downloading things, a new game update in the background or whatever that may interfere. So this is perhaps a slightly better, more trustworthy metric. And you can see it's nice and smooth. Uh, the curve. Uh, these are actual data points uh, that I, I collected from an actual insertion sort uh, implementation in Python. <clears throat> okay, so that's anyway a simple algorithm. Let's talk about some strategies now. So I want to talk about three strategies, the divide and conquer, the greedy, and the dynamic programming strategy. So as I mentioned, there are a few others that you'll learn a little bit more about later, but this gives you a good starting point. And in fact, some of the other algorithm strategies are more extensions of these same ideas. Uh, but this is a good way for you to actually solve many problems. As we're going to see, there are some pretty common computer science problems that we're going to talk about in the course of this discussion today. And I'm going to show you how uh, these algorithm strategies are used to solve those problems, but they're not limited to that one problem. They can be used in lots of different situations. And in fact, there are many algorithms that employ the divide and conquer or the greedy or the dynamic programming strategy. You're going to see dozens of these algorithms for each of these three uh, through the course of your undergraduate degree. So first let's talk about divide and conquer. So I don't technically know where the name comes from, but I like to envision a Roman general, uh, for example. Um, they're, they're facing an opponent and maybe they're evenly matched, maybe even they're outnumbered. And the strategy might be <clears throat> to, uh, to attack the army in such a way that they pinch off a, a bit of the army. So some of the soldiers, maybe a quarter or so of the soldiers, are isolated and surrounded uh, by the bulk of your army. Um, and then, you know, that sort of tips the scales. So some of the soldiers now have been killed and now you have the more advanced numbers and you have the advantage. So uh, that's the, the military strategy. It is a valid military strategy and the name has been kind of co-opted by uh, a, a, an algorithm strategy that uses a, a something anyway semi-inspired by the concept. So the idea is um, it's, it's hard to fight a big giant army 
it's also hard to solve some computer science problems. So the problems themselves right now are too difficult to solve. So instead of solving them, what we're going to do is we're going to solve some part of it, just like instead of fighting the whole army at once, let's just attack just a part, one of the flanks of the army uh, at a time. And now the problem is simpler, right? We have a smaller army to defeat, or we have a smaller problem to solve. Um, all we have to do is solve that smaller problem. And sometimes we can continue the process. So if even if now that we've divide, divided and conquered, um, maybe it's still the case that the problem is still unsolvable. So let's divide and conquer again. Eventually we're going to get down to a problem that's so, so easy that it's trivial to solve. <clears throat> so that's the basic idea with divide and conquer. So it's not a perfect name. It's a good name, but it's not a perfect name. I mean, it certainly is catchy, <laughs> but um, there are actually three steps. So divide and conquer doesn't capture all three of the steps. So the first step, of course, is the divide step. What we're going to do is we're going to take the problem, we're going to divide it into smaller or easier to solve subproblems. So let's say, for example, I want to sort a list, just like we did with insertion sort. So one way to sort a list is to use divide and conquer, which basically says, you know what, let's divide the list into smaller lists and let's sort the smaller lists. So in fact, there is an algorithm that does exactly that, the merge sort algorithm that we mentioned a little bit later. So it divides the list literally in half, and then it recursively sorts each of the two halves of the list. And because we're using recursion, that's also going to divide that half of a list into two halves and sort them. And eventually you get down to a list that's really small, like it just has one element in it. So there's no real need to solve anything. So that first we divide the problem, then we recursively solve. This is the conquer step. Uh, but one thing that was not mentioned, because I guess from a military standpoint, there's no equivalent, but when you're solving computer problems this way, you then have to take the two solutions. So imagine you divide the list in half, you sort the two halves of the list. Now you have to combine the two sorted half lists together into a single sorted list. This is an important step that kind of gets left out of the name but it is very important depending on the algorithm. So that's the way the merge sort algorithm works actually. It divides the list in half, that's pretty easy to do. First half of the list, second half of the list, just find the middle point. Uh, and then we recursively sort the list, which is also pretty easy to do because it's the algorithm we're currently writing. Uh, and if the list is small enough, then I can just not do anything, right? If the list is just one element in it, one element sorted, we've already established that. Uh, and then finally, the hard part of a merge sort is to take the two sorted lists and merge them together. So we have to like go through both lists one at a time and pick the smaller elements until we get to the largest elements. We also need a base case because we're talking about recursively solving these problems. And by the way, divide and conquer doesn't have to be done recursively, but initially we'll think about the solution as a recursive one, and then we can turn that into a non-recursive uh, solution. Uh, just you might not be at this point where you feel confident enough about your recursion abilities uh, to, to say this, maybe you do, uh, but the recursive step is actually the easiest way to solve these problems. And then you're going to think about it a little bit more to try to figure out how am I going to do this without recursion. So this is usually the thought process when you're using divide and conquer. But anyway, when you're using recursion, you have to have a base case. So you have to have a sub problem that's trivial enough to solve so that you don't need recursion in order to solve it. All right, so an example of such an algorithm is the binary search algorithm. So it's an example of divide and conquer. So we have a big, line, a big giant list to search. We want to search if, uh, if it has a particular element in it. So imagine, for example, I've got a list of customers, and somebody comes in, and they're like, I don't know if I have an account or not. Uh, and so you want to search uh, through the list of customers. Well, you have millions of customers. So it's very inefficient for you to search one at a time through the list. Um, you want to use a more efficient strategy. So binary search works like this. First of all, I just want to point out that you have to have the list be sorted in advance. So it's very handy that we just happen to talk about binary search right after we talked about a couple of sorting algorithms. We use one of those sorting algorithms to sort the list first. The, and that's a very expensive operation to do. Uh, but the idea here is I'm going to sort it one time, and then I'm going to binary search it many, many, many times. So if I'm going to do tens of thousands of binary searches, it's going to have been worth it to have sorted the list first. 
Okay, so that is a thing. If you don't have a sorted list, then binary search won't work. And we'll see why that is. So binary search is an example of an algorithm that is also fairly straightforward. And it's just like insertion sort, it's probably something that you might have been able to come up with on your own. Uh, in fact, like when I'm playing cards, for instance, and I'm looking at my hand of cards and I want to make sure that those cards are in a particular order, I use a variant of insertion sort in order to put the cards in the proper order. I take a card, I stick it in the proper sorted order, I take another card, stick it in the proper sorted order. Uh, that's basically how I do it myself, and I just naturally did that. I didn't invent an algorithm or anything. It's something that's re relatively intuitive. Uh, and with binary search, similarly, um, if I'm looking through my contacts on my phone, and I know, for example, that somebody's name starts with an M. Let's say I have somebody named uh, McPherson in my phone. And that's, you know, it's an M that's in the middle of the alphabet. So what I do is I kind of jump to the middle of my contact list. And uh, if, you know, I, it turns out that I land on something like, uh, you know, P uh, Proctor or whatever. And uh, so I know that you know, Proctor is after McPherson. And so I go to the beginning part of the list and I scroll up a bit. And if, for, on the other hand, maybe it was something like, uh, you know, Lyserson or whatever is the name, uh, then I know that McPherson comes after Lyserson. So I scroll down to the lower part of my contact list. And so I use something that's inherently quite similar, not identical, but quite similar to binary search. And if you're looking up a word in the dictionary, uh, you'll end up using a pretty similar looking strategy. All right, so you start with a sorted list. Um, if the list is empty, you're done. Well, that seems pretty obvious. If the list is empty, you haven't found the thing you're looking for because there are no elements to search. That seems kind of ridiculous, but this is going to start to make sense as I describe the algorithm. Because remember, this is a recursive algorithm, so eventually we're going to make the list smaller and smaller. Uh, at some point in time, the list might be empty. Okay, so what we're going to do is we're going to divide the list into three parts. Well, kind of. We're going to basically divide it in half. We're going to have like the first half of the list, just for the sake of simplicity, call that A. And the second half of the list, we're going to call that B. And the exact middle element, let's just call that M. Okay, it's just literally one element. So there's the first half of the list, not including the middle element, and that's A. There's the second half of the list, not including the middle element, and that's B. And then there's the middle element by itself. So first, what we're going to do is we're going to look for, we're going to look at M. If M is the element that we're looking for, great, we found it. it happened to be exactly in the middle, or the odds. So we just say, yeah, I found it. We return that customer, uh, customer's ID to them. If the thing that we're looking for is actually, it comes before, so we have to have some way of determining you know, what the order of these values are, but we're gonna compare M and the thing we're looking for. And so imagine the thing that, I'm, let's say that these are numbers, and let's say that M is 11, for instance. And I'm looking for seven. Well, seven is less than 11. Okay, so it must be somewhere in A. If it's in the list at all, it has to be in A. It can't be in B because this list is sorted and all of the elements after the M are either greater than or equal to M. So we don't, I don't have to search in any of B at all if I know the value I'm looking for is less than M. So I don't have to look in B at all. So I've basically just eliminated half of the list without even searching it. This is one of the things that makes binary search such an efficient algorithm. And if the thing that I'm looking for is greater than M, then I don't need to search A. So all I do in these cases, if it's less than M, I recursively search A. So I use binary search again, but only on the A part, which is slightly less than half the size of the list. And if the thing I'm looking for is greater than M, then I recursively search B, which again, B is slightly less than half the size of the list. And I could end right away by finding the element. So this is a very efficient algorithm. And the worst case scenario happens when the element I'm looking for isn't in the list. And eventually I have to search um, as, as many elements as, as uh, possible. It's still very efficient. So for this binary search, we're gonna first make sure that the list is sorted. You can see in this case that this is sorted. And I'm going to use the same list for all of the examples. We're just going to search for different elements so that we can see how different scenarios play out within the algorithm. 
So in this first situation, we're going to search for the value 11, which represents kind of a typical situation. We can see that the 11 is in the list, but it doesn't happen to be exactly in the middle of the list, so we're not going to find it really early. It's going to take a lot of effort to find this element. Okay, so the way this algorithm works is we're first going to uh, to remember the start and end index is used as an indicator. So we're going to search the entire list. So the start index is the first index of the list and the end index is the last index of the list. We're then going to calculate the middle index by taking the average of these two. So the average index is going to be pointing to the six here in this case. Now, if we look at this, the to find element is 11, which is greater than the middle element six. So it can't possibly between, be between start and mid inclusive. It has to be between mid plus one and end. So what we're going to do is we're going to move the start pointer to mid plus one, or the start index to mid plus one. We're going to leave the end index at the same spot, and we're just going to repeat the process again. Okay, so let's shift over the start index. And now we're looking for 11, so let's find the middle point. Now we kind of round it down in this case because it happened to be in between the index for the 17 and the 18. Uh, but we round it down in this case. And uh, in this situation, we looked at the 11, uh, the 17 rather, and the 11 is less than the 17. So I don't need to consider it the 18 or the 21 because I know those are definitely values that are greater than 17. So it's certainly the 11 is not going to be in there. So I repeat the process. I know that the value, if it's in the list at all, it must be to the left of this midpoint. So I don't need to consider any of the values from mid to end in the array. And I still have already eliminated most of the list. There's only one element left. So now what I'm going to do is I'm going to move the end pointer to mid minus one, which happens to be the same position where the start pointer is. Okay, so those are going to occupy the same space. Let's just clean that up a little bit. The mid pointer, of course, works out to the exact same position uh, because, of course, the average of two values that are exactly the same is also going to be exactly the same. And I look at that midpoint to see that the value is 11. That's the thing I'm looking for. So this is a successful search. I maybe return true or whatever, indicating that I did find the value. All right, for this next example, uh, another pretty typical example, I'm going to be searching for the element 9 within the list. 9 doesn't exist in the list, uh, so that's you know, uh, probable occurrence and a typical search. So I'm going to try to find a 9. So I repeat the same process. Start and end index are average to figure out the midpoint. That's a 6. Now a 6 is actually less than the thing I'm trying to look for. I'm trying to look for 9. So I know that the 9, if it exists anywhere in the list, can't be in any of the values between start and mid. And so it must be at mid plus 1 or later. Okay, so I shift the start index over to mid plus one, and I again repeat the process. So the midpoint gets calculated here, and that's a 17. The thing I'm looking for is less than 17, so I can eliminate all the indexes from mid to end, and now I'm just going to move the end pointer to the start pointer. This is playing out exactly the way it played out for the 11, but at the end, it's gonna change a little bit, because when I slide that end index over, the start index and midpoint all point to that 11, but that's not the value. So I ran out of numbers to search. There's nowhere else to look. I can just stop. Okay, so in this case, I can return false. Nope, the value is not in the list. Another scenario is that the value I'm looking for could be very close to the beginning of the list. Process works in the same way, but just to show you that it can handle these kind of extreme situations, so let's look for negative two in this case. Starting the process exactly the same, the start and end index. The midpoint is the 6. I'm looking for negative 2, which is less than the 6. So I adjust the end pointer to point to mid minus 1. Repeat the process again. That finds the midpoint where this 1 is. So again, I don't need to look at the end of the list. I can look at the beginning of the list. So all three pointers point to this first element, which happens to be the negative 2 that I'm searching for. A very similar scenario is if I'm trying to search for a value that would be before the first element in the sorted list. So let's try to search for negative 5. We'll see it plays out very similarly. So the midpoint is still the index of the 6 again, but it's less, so we search the left half of the list. Finding the midpoint is, in this case, the middle element is 1, so we search the left half of that list. And again, start, mid, and end all point to the first element, but that's not negative 5, so we ran out of elements 
and we stop searching. So similar to finding at the beginning of the list, let's look for an element that's at the end of the list. So we'll start the process in the same way. We're going to look for 21 in this case. The midpoint is the 6. 21 is greater than the 6, so we search the right half of the list. The middle element in this case is going to be the 17. 21 is greater than the 17, so we search the right half of the list. The middle element in this case is going to round down to the 18. 21 is greater than the 18, so we're going to shift the, the start pointer over. And now the start, mid, and end all point to the last element, which so happens is the last element. So it took the maximum amount of effort to find these elements at the beginning and the end of the list, but eventually did find them. So much like the last scenario, we're going to look for an element that would be after the final element of the list. The process is going to be very similar, but on the very last step, we're going to realize that there's an element is not in the list. So we're going to look for a 32. So again, the process is the same. Let's look at the middle element. 32 is greater than 6, so we search the right half. The middle element now is 17 again. 32 is greater than 17, so we search the right half of that list. The middle element in this case is the 18. 32 is greater, so we search the right half of that list. Now there's just a one element list. It's 21. That's not 32, so we didn't find it. All right, one more example that I think is worth mentioning, uh, that it is actually possible that I find the value right away. Uh, it's not super likely, but it is a possibility. So in this case, I'm going to look for 6. And I start the process exactly the same way. The start and index are the exact same. And the midpoint happens to point exactly to the 6. And that happens to be the thing I'm looking for. So I find it right away. So it's possible to get one of these early exit scenarios. OK. So here's the, the pseudocode, because we are a little bit more familiar with the syntax. I'll go a little bit quicker through this process. Uh, but the algorithm is called binary search. Um, and there, uh, there are two main things that we're passing to the algorithm. X is the thing that we're looking for. And A is the list where we're looking for it. So X is a single element that we're trying to see if it exists in A. A is the list of all the values. And then there's also a start and end index. So the start index is, what index am I going to start searching? And end is, what index am I going to stop searching? So from the beginning to the end, for example. So this seems kind of unnecessary, because of course we want to search the entire list. But the reason why we have these in here is for the recursive calls. When we recursively call, I'm going to search from the, the, the start to the middle, or I'm going to start, search from the middle to the end of the list. And so I put these in here, even though they're not necessary the first time I call binary search. Uh, they're very useful later on. All right, so the base case happens when the start value is greater than the end value. Remember, these are two indexes in the array, and the start index is supposed to be to the left of the end index. So it's supposed to be a smaller value. And even if it were equal, that would be okay, because it would just mean I'm searching from this one index to that same index, meaning I'm only searching one element. Theoretically, that one element could be the thing I'm looking for. But if start is greater than end, that means there are zero elements in between those two indexes, and so I have nothing to find. So this is literally just the first rule in our algorithm. It's saying if the list is empty, then you can't find the value, right? There are no elements to search. All right, line three calculates the middle index. So this is not to be confused with the M in the previous slide. M was the actual value that I found in the middle. Middle here is the index of the middle element. So all I do is take the average of the start and end position in order to find the middle. That's pretty straightforward. Add them together, divide by 2. Uh, in Python, you would want to use slash slash 2 so that it did integer division, because you want this to be an index. It can't be a floating point value. And then all I do is I check the three conditions. So the first thing I do is I check to see if the thing I'm looking for is the element that's at the middle position. If it is, I found it. Great. I can, I can stop. If the thing I'm looking for is less than that middle element, however, then here's the tricky part. I'm going to call binary search again. This is a recursive call. I'm still looking for the same x. I'm still using the same array. But the start and middle values are different. The start and end values are different, rather. I'm going to search from the beginning of the list all the way up to, but not including the middle element. There's no reason to search the middle element, because I literally just checked it on line 4, and it doesn't match the thing I'm looking for. So I can go all the way up to middle minus 1. So that's my new end. So start stays in the same spot but I move the end index to the middle minus one. 
so that I don't search the latter half of the list. And in the other condition, this is if x is greater than the middle element, then what I do instead is I call binary search with the start index moved to middle plus one, and the end index is kept exactly the same. So this now looks at just the second half of the list. So on line seven, I'm recursively searching the the beginning half of the list, which we called A on the previous slide. And in the line nine, I'm just uh, searching for just the latter half of the list, what we call B on the previous slide. All right, if you perform a similar analysis to this algorithm, you'll see that it takes on this shape. And this is a little bit more jagged because there's not enough data points here. You have to have a very, very big long list in order for this to get a nice smooth curve. But um, you can see that it kind of curves the opposite way of an insertion sort, uh, the insertion sort graph. Uh, and this corresponds to a logarithm. Uh, so this is uh, kind of like a log n, n is the number of elements that are in the list. And what's kind of neat about that, and I, uh, by the way, I'm, there's, I'm just pulled that answer out of a magic box. Uh, you'll learn how to do this analysis uh, in a future course, but um, I'll just tell you right now that the performance of binary search is a log, the logarithm of n. Um, and what's really cool about that is if I double the size of the list, um, it actually only takes one more operation. So like normally like sorting the list, if you double the size of the list means it takes four times as much uh, of processing to do. Uh, whereas in a binary search, it doesn't double the amount of searching that I need to do. It only adds one more number that I need to search, uh, which is quite cool. So if I can search a billion element list in say one second, then I can search a two billion element list in a second plus like a millisecond, right? To check one more element, uh, which is actually quite cool because every single step of binary search eliminates half of the list, a little bit more than half actually. So if I have a two billion element list, I first look at the middle element of that 2 billion element list at index 1 billion, let's say. And if the value I'm looking for is less than that middle element, then I search the first billion elements minus one. Uh, and if it's greater than the middle element, then I search the second half, the second billion elements of the list. And then I'm just now searching a billion element list. So that should take one second. So this is actually very efficient for really, really big lists. Of course, the, the warning is that you have to have uh, the list be sorted in advance. That itself is pretty computationally expensive. But for things like frequent lookups, this can be advantageous. So lots of other uh, divide and conquer algorithms. The quicksort algorithm is also divide and conquer. Uh, so the way quicksort works, we're not going to implement this, but I'll just give you a basic idea. What you do is you take some element pivot. It can be the first element of the list. It can be the last element of the list. It can be an element in the middle or you can choose a specific value. If you specifically choose a median value, then this is actually uh, guarantees that quicksort will work well. Uh, but a common way is just to literally pick the element in the middle of the list, uh, which is not a very efficient way of doing it. But anyway, uh, we'll call that the pivot. And all the elements that are less than the pivot, we're going to put into a separate sublist. We're going to call that sublist A. And all the elements that are greater than or equal to the pivot, we're going to put into another sublist B. Then what we're going to do is we're recursively going to sort A, we're recursively going to sort B, and then what we're going to do is we're going to glue all three of those things together. We're going to uh, put first the sorted A, and then the pivot value, which is supposed to be in between the A values and the B values, and then finally we concatenate the sorted B list at the end. And this makes sense if you think about it, because all the elements that were smaller than the pivot were in A, so when it's sorted, presumably they're in proper order, but they're all elements that are smaller than the pivot, and then the pivot, and then B, which are all elements that are greater than or equal to B. And so as long as the B elements are also sorted, then A, pivot, B should be in sort of order. So it's a very clever concept. It breaks down when you have an element, a list that's already sorted or sorted in reverse order. It doesn't work particularly well. Of course, it still sorts them, but it does so in a way that actually costs as much as insertion sort, but without the, the elegance of the simple algorithm of insertion sort. But anyway, it's a pretty cool idea. And I mentioned also that merge sort, which is another sorting algorithm, also uses divide and conquer in a slightly different way. And so just to show you how versatile uh, the divide and conquer strategy is. You can even create 
two separate sorting algorithms, solving the exact same problem using the exact same algorithm strategy, but using it in a slightly different way, comes up with a whole new algorithm, which I think is pretty neat. So now let's talk about greedy algorithms. So I know that probably somebody taught you that it's bad to be greedy, but I'm just going to say to you that sometimes it's good to be greedy. A greedy mindset gives you some impulses that's going to help you to optimize something. And so in greedy in this case, what we're going to do is we're going to develop an algorithm that's going to make a choice that solves the problem as much as possible before uh, choosing any options that are like uh, solve smaller part of the problem. We want to basically solve as much of it as possible. So a pretty good example, if you've ever worked in retail, is you want to give somebody some change. Like I know we don't use cash anymore, but imagine that you owe somebody a certain amount of money and you owe them $27.13. A sensible thing that you might do is first going to give them a $20 bill because it gives them as much of the change as you owe them as possible. This is a greedy choice. Right? You're making the choice that solves as much of the problem as possible. So you owe them $27.13. By giving them 20, you now only owe them $7.13. There isn't any other choice that can get you closer to your destination. So you choose the $20 first. If you gave them a $10, you still owe them $17.13. And so they you still have a long more a lot more to go. So by choosing the greedy choice, uh, you're actually making a choice that's going to get the problem solved as efficiently as possible. At least that's the theory. Okay, so greedy algorithm doesn't always produce the most efficient solution, doesn't always produce the optimal solution, but oftentimes it does. Okay, so we always want to make the greedy choice with a greedy algorithm. So for example, I'm trying to find an optimal path to get through somewhere. Uh, so for example, I'm trying to drive to the university and I'm at my house. So I get to uh, an intersection and I can turn left, I can go straight, I can turn right, or I can make a U-turn and turn back. <laughs> That's probably not legal. Um, in that case, I'm going to choose, well, if I go to the left, am I getting closer to the university? If I go straight, am I getting closer to the university? Which one of those four choices is going to get me closer to the university? Okay, so... This is, would be a greedy strategy for driving to the university. Let's say I had a device that told me how far I am from class. <laughs> and if that number goes down, um, then that's the path that I want to choose. Another option might be for you know translating between different languages. So for example, if I want to translate from English to Japanese, I will choose the longest sequence of words because sometimes, um, and English is pretty famous for this, we have some very confusing expressions in English. Um, that really don't make any sense if you just kind of take them at face value. So for example, there's the expression, it's raining cats and dogs. Well, it probably won't surprise you too much to, to find out that in Japanese, that expression is meaningless, right? And so if I were to translate the English phrase, it's raining cats and dogs, which just means it's raining a lot, um, by literally translating the words, it's raining cats and dogs into Japanese, um, a Japanese person will be very confused by that because it doesn't make any sense. It really doesn't make sense. <laughs> and so, but what we might do is for expressions like that, they're called idiomatic expressions. Uh, we might convert, we might have a rule that says it's raining cats and dogs gets translated into the Japanese equivalent of it's raining a lot. Okay, and then it'll still make sense when it gets translated. So we prefer the bigger uh, sequence of words to the smaller sequence of words so that we can, we can handle cases like that where we have idiomatic expressions that we want to, uh, to account for. So greedy algorithms, they're not perfect, um, but they can solve some problems in an optimal way. Let's use what we're after. So let's look at an abstract problem. So the knapsack problem, not the fractional version that we're going to be addressing today, but the knapsack problem in general is a classic problem in computer science. Um, it's a difficult problem to solve, uh, to say the least. Um, but it's a pretty interesting problem. So imagine you're, you're Indiana Jones or somebody like Indiana Jones, and you found your way into a huge uh, hoard of treasure. Okay, so there's gold, diamonds, uh, carvings, historical items, or whatever. 
But let's say you're not like Indiana Jones and you don't think things belong in a museum. You instead want to sell things and make as much money as possible. Okay, so you're just a treasure hunter. You're not really doing things for the good of society. You're doing it for your wallet, okay? So you have a knapsack. This is, of course, a uh, problem was proposed by a British person. So I'll say backpack. Uh, you have a backpack with capacity C. So whatever capacity is, it could be how much space you have in there. Uh, but maybe for simplicity, let's just say that it's the weight that you can carry. Because, uh, you know, inevitably there's going to be some gigantic rock that starts rolling or the, the ceiling is going to collapse or whatever, and you're going to have to get out of there. So you don't want to pack this backpack too full. So you have all of these valuables, and each of these valuables has a weight and it has a value. And obviously you don't have room to take it all. So what you want to do is you want to choose enough stuff that's under your weight limit, but you want to get the maximum value when you come out of that. Now, there are two versions of this problem. There's the fractional knapsack problem, and then there's the zero-one knapsack problem. The zero-one knapsack problem says, well, if you see a value, if you see an item, rather, you can either take it or you cannot. You can take zero of that item or you can take one of that item. So, for example, if there's a gold statue, you can take the gold statue or you cannot take the gold statue. The fractional version of the knapsack problem says, well, if you don't have room for the gold statue in your backpack, you can cut it in half or cut it into thirds or eighths or whatever and take just a piece of it to fill the rest of your backpack. All right, so that one's breaking the rules. And for like historical value, the fractional knapsack problem wouldn't really work because you know you don't, nobody wants to see one tenth of a gold statue in a museum uh, if they can help it. Uh, but the zero one knapsack problem kind of corresponds to somebody who is looking for things to put in their museum. Uh, the fractional knapsack problem corresponds to, I want to melt this gold statue down and get some money for it. Okay, so it actually is sensible still. So what we're going to do is we're going to solve the fractional version of the knapsack problem with the greedy strategy. Okay. Um, so one problem that we're going to do is we're going to calculate the value to weight ratio. So not the weight to value ratio, but the value to weight ratio. So basically we're just going to divide the value by the weight for every single value. And we're going to order the items by their value to weight ratio. And we're just going to start piling in the things that have the highest value to weight ratio into our backpack until the backpack is full. When we encounter a value that we can't quite fit into the backpack, because this is the fractional knapsack problem, I can then chop that item up the exact amount that I have room for and put that in my backpack. Now my backpack is 100% full. I have the most value that I can get. The presumption here is that if you, you know, divide an element in half, then it still has half the value. Um, this can be shown to be an optimal solution to the fractional knapsack problem. Okay, so let's look at an animation of this. I'm also going to show you an animation of the zero one knapsack problem so that you can see that this doesn't guarantee an optimal solution to the zero one knapsack problem. The zero one knapsack problem is actually a very difficult, more difficult problem to solve. So let's try to solve the zero one knapsack problem using a greedy strategy. So we enter the treasure room, we've got a whole bunch of items. So we've got a gold statue that's valued at $6 million, weighed six, a stone statue valued at half a million dollars, weighted 50 kilos, and a gold statue uh, worth five and a half million dollars, weighed five kilos, and a jeweled necklace worth a hundred million dollars, uh, weighing at one tenth of a kilo. So first, let's calculate the value to weight ratio here. The value to weight ratio on the jeweled necklace is $1 billion per kilo. Uh, the gold statue one uh, is value to weight at $1.1 million per kilo. The gold statue two is $1 million per kilo, not a huge difference there. And the stone statue is valued at $0.01 million or $10,000 per kilo. So that one has the least value and probably we're not going to bring that because it's huge. All right, so our knapsack or our backpack has capacity 6.2 kilograms. We've decided that's the maximum weight. So all we're going to do is just start grabbing values starting from the top since we've now ordered them in order of value to weight. So first we're going to grab the jeweled necklace. Of course, we're going to grab the jeweled necklace. It's worth the most and it weighs practically nothing. So that's going to make our, make it so that our knapsack has capacity of only 6.1 left. 
And so if we grab the next value, the next highest value to weight ratio is gold statue one. So we grab gold statue one. It fits in our backpack. It weighs five and we have room for 6.1. So that's fine so far. Okay. And uh, now we don't have enough room for anything else in our backpack. Now it's important to note here that this is actually not the most efficient situation uh, because actually had we grabbed gold statue two, we would have another half a million dollars. And there was enough room for us to have gold statue two because we had capacity of 6.1 before this began. But you'll notice that this is a very close to optimal solution. Remember that the zero one problem is not optimally solvable using greedy, uh, but you'll notice that it is a pretty close to optimal solution nevertheless. Now let's actually consider what the optimal strategy for the zero one problem is. We don't actually have an algorithm for this, <laughs> but uh, let's just see what it would be. So the exact same four values, calculating their value to weight ratio is the same and ordering them of course is the same. And the capacity of our knapsack is the same. We're gonna grab the jeweled necklace first and then we're gonna grab the gold statue. So again, we don't have an algorithm for determining this, but I've looked at these numbers. There's only there's only four items, so this is very easy to solve just using brute force. Uh, I've looked at these values and just have determined this is the best way. So this is the most value that we can get. We get $106 million worth of value. Uh, we still have 0 0.1 kilos uh, in a room in our backpack, but there's no element that weighs that much. So for the 0-1 knapsack problem, I can't grab part of an item and therefore it's not possible for me to do any better than this. For the fractional knapsack problem, however, the situation is quite different. Um, now, obviously we're gonna use the same items here just for demonstration purposes. We have the same items. We're still gonna calculate their value to weight ratio and reorder the values from highest to lowest value to weight ratio. But this time we're gonna start grabbing the values one at a time. But when I run out of space for a whole item, I'm gonna put a partial item in there. So I add the same two items that we did with the zero one knapsack problem. So I add the jeweled necklace and the gold statue one. Um, and that actually leaves me, I think I calculated this thing correctly, but um, zero, I think this is actually supposed to be a different value. I'm sorry about that. Uh, but I still have enough room in my, uh, in my knapsack for a little bit more. So now what I do is I divide the gold statue two uh, for the sake of, here, I'm going to just going to split it into two separate values, the piece that I can fit into my backpack uh, and then the part that I cannot fit into my backpack. So in this case, this allows me to fit a little bit more in there and I get uh, a little bit more value. So whereas um, I previously had uh, $106 million worth of value, I get $106.6 .6 million worth of value. So a slight improvement. Not a huge improvement, and of course, only realistic if you know splitting up the gold statue into pieces actually made sense and gave me the proportional amount of the worth. Nevertheless, uh, you can see with the fractional knapsack problem, it's a simple greedy strategy that can solve it in an optimal way. All right. Uh, so the last, uh, the last algorithm strategy is called dynamic programming. So dynamic programming has a terrible name. <laughs> Basically what it means is sometimes when you're solving a problem, you end up solving the same subproblem over and over. So imagine I use divide and conquer to solve a problem. Uh, and divide and conquer involves me doing the same little thing over and over and over again. Um, what dynamic programming says, it's kind of a sensible option. Well, if you solve a subproblem, just remember the solution for that subproblem. But make a note of it somewhere. We'll call this the memo table, let's say. Make a memo of the solution to that problem. And if I ever encounter that subproblem again, I'll look it up in the table so I don't have to solve it again. I can just use the solution that's sitting there in the table. So again, it's a pretty sensible idea. Okay, so what we're gonna do is we're gonna reuse solutions. And in fact, a related concept to dynamic programming is called a memo, memoization. Uh, and so, you just store all the solutions that you encounter as you start solving the bigger problem. All the solutions that you end up coming up with um, end up getting put into some kind of uh, data structure uh, that's you know, easy to access. It may not be something as simple as a table, 
But for simplicity, let's just consider a table. If the number of subproblems that we need to solve is huge, then a table might not be a very efficient way of storing it. Uh, but for the purposes of our demo here, it'll be fine. So here is the Fibonacci algorithm. Uh, and I'll just let you know that this Fibonacci algorithm abides by the divide and conquer strategy. And the divide and conquer strategy has kind of failed us here because this is a very inefficient strategy. Okay, I'm going to show you an animation of this. So I'll, I'll kind of skip through uh, some of these uh, some of these slides pretty quickly here. Uh, but the reason why this is so inefficient is because you can see a lot of duplication, right? When I over here, I have to calculate the, the Fibonacci number three in order to calculate the f five Fibonacci number. I have to calculate the four and the three. But to calculate the four, I also need to calculate the three and the two. So I calculate Fib three twice, and that's really wasteful. And you can also see that I calculate Fib two here, here, and here. So there's a lot of duplication here. And as I calculate bigger and bigger Fibonacci numbers, the duplication is really, really big. So the dynamic programming solution to this is to just start keeping a list of all of the Fibonacci numbers. So the first two Fibonacci numbers are 0 and 1. Index 0 is Fibonacci number is 0. Index 1, Fibonacci number is 1. And then what I do is I just, if it's one of these base cases, instead of just returning the value, I return the value from the list. I guess it doesn't really matter that much. I could use the same if statement from the previous one if I wanted to. If n is less than 1, just return n. But I put it in the list, I might as well use it, right? And then what I do is I go through all of the numbers up to my n that I'm looking for, and I just calculate the solution by adding the two existing values together. Now, I already know, because I'm going from the lowest i number to the highest i number, that the lower numbers are already in my list. I already have 0 and 1 in my list. So if I'm starting at index 2, for example, then 0 and 1 are already in my list. So I just look it up at index zero and index, uh, sorry, index one and index zero, add those two together. I add them to the list for next time. So as the number grows, I have all the lower indexes of Fibonacci number in my list. And then finally, when I've calculated all the Fibonacci numbers, I then just return the nth one. And this solution is much more efficient. Let's look at the diagram to see why that is. So we're gonna calculate the Fibonacci number five and I'm going to show you the order in which these get calculated. So according to the definition of Fibonacci, to calculate Fibonacci 5, I need to calculate Fibonacci 4 and Fibonacci 3. But before I even get started on calculating Fibonacci 3, I need to figure out what Fibonacci 4 is. This is the order that it would actually be calculated if I implemented this using the naive recursive algorithm that we saw in the slides. So the uh, Fibonacci 4 needs to be calculated by calculating the Fibonacci 3 and the Fibonacci 2. But before I calculate the Fibonacci 2, I first need to calculate fully the Fibonacci 3 number. So I don't calculate Fibonacci 2 right away. So in order to calculate Fibonacci 3, I need to calculate Fibonacci 2 and Fibonacci 1. But before I get to Fibonacci 1, I need to calculate Fibonacci 2 first. To calculate Fibonacci 2, I calculate Fibonacci 1, which is a base case, and Fibonacci 0, which is also a base case. So now I know the Fibonacci 2 number, which is going to be 0 plus 1, or 1. And then I, need to go, I can go back to where I was calculating Fibonacci 3 and now calculate Fibonacci 1. So Fibonacci 1 is also 1. So Fibonacci 2 is 1. Fibonacci 1 is 1. So Fibonacci 3 is the sum of those two, or 2. So now I know that Fibonacci 3 is 2. So now I can go back up to where I was calculating Fibonacci 4 and I can calculate Fibonacci 2, which is the other half of the sum. Um, Fibonacci 2, I already know what it is, but the algorithm, it, this is a naive recursive algorithm, it's going to calculate it once again. So it's going to calculate Fibonacci 1, and then calculate Fibonacci 0, and calculate that Fibonacci 2 is 1 again. So now I know that Fibonacci 3 is equal to 2, and Fibonacci 2 is equal to 1, so I know that Fibonacci 4 is equal to 2 plus 1. Okay, so Fibonacci 4 is now equal to 3. So now I go up to the top level. I go back to the original calculation. I only calculated the first recursive call to Fibonacci, Fibonacci 4. I still need to go back and calculate Fibonacci 3. Again, to calculate Fibonacci 3, I need to calculate Fibonacci 2 and fully calculate Fibonacci 2 before I go on to the other part of Fibonacci 3, which is Fibonacci 1. So I'm going to calculate Fibonacci 2. 
by determining Fibonacci 1 and Fibonacci 0. These are both base cases, so I can determine that. That's 0 plus 1 again, so Fibonacci 2 is equal to 1. Then I go back up to where I was calculating Fibonacci 3, and then I add to it Fibonacci 1. So now I have Fibonacci 1, which is 1, and Fibonacci 2, which is 1. Fibonacci 3 is now 2. So now I can take that 2 that I just calculated for Fibonacci 3, and the 3 that I calculated for Fibonacci 4, and then I can make that go up to the top for Fibonacci 5 and calculate that Fibonacci 5 is 5. Okay, so that's how it works. Let's just highlight some of the duplication of work that we're doing. You notice that we calculated Fibonacci 3 twice, uh, which was a lot of work. We also calculated Fibonacci 2 three times, uh, which is a lot of unnecessary work. So let's eliminate some of that redundancy. So this is our dynamic programming version. Uh, what I'm going to do is I'm going to calculate the two base cases and put them in my memo table. So on the left is the memo table. I'm going to calculate the 0 Fibonacci number is 0, and the 1 Fibonacci number is 1. And then as I calculate more, I'm just going to add them to this memo table. So again, we're going to calculate Fibonacci 5. In order to do that, I'm going to calculate Fibonacci 4. So I'm going to just use this red rounded rectangle here to indicate the currently executing recursive call. So to calculate Fibonacci 5, I need to calculate Fibonacci 4. And we're going to complete the calculation of Fibonacci 4 before we go back to Fibonacci 5 and finish the rest of that calculation. So to calculate Fibonacci 4, we need to calculate Fibonacci 3. None of these are possible to figure out right now. So I need to now figure out what Fibonacci 3 is equal to. So again, going back to the definition, it's equal to Fibonacci 2 plus Fibonacci 1. I don't know what Fibonacci 2 is. None of these are in the memo table. So I still need to keep calculating. So to calculate Fibonacci 2, I need to figure out Fibonacci 1 plus Fibonacci 0. Those two I do know. Those are both in the table. So Fibonacci 1 is in my table. It's 1. And then Fibonacci 0 is also in the table. It's equal to 0. So now going back up, I can now calculate the rest of Fibonacci 2 by adding these two together. So now I know that Fibonacci 2 is equal to 1. And just for the sake of completeness, let's add it to our memo table. So now we know Fibonacci 2 is equal to 1 in the memo table. Now I go back to the call. So I'm finished with this call to Fibonacci 2. I go back up to the paused calculation for Fibonacci 3. Fibonacci 3 was Fibonacci 2 plus Fibonacci 1. That's in the table. So now I can calculate that Fibonacci 3 is equal to Fibonacci 2 plus Fibonacci 1, or 1 plus 1. So Fibonacci 3 is 1 plus 1, or 2. We're going to put that in the memo table as well. And then we're going to go back up to the call for Fibonacci 4, which means that we're going to have to calculate Fibonacci 2. Well, that's already in our memo table from the previous calculation. So that's already a 1. So now we can figure out that Fibonacci 4 is equal to Fibonacci 3, which is 2, plus Fibonacci 2, which is 1, 2 plus 1. Okay, so that's going to give us Fibonacci 4 is equal to 3. And we're going to put that in our memo table, of course. Finally, we go back up to the Fibonacci 5 calculation. Fibonacci 5 was equal to Fibonacci 4, which we just calculated. And Fibonacci 3, which we have previously calculated, that's in our memo table. So now we can just add Fibonacci 4, which is 3, to Fibonacci 3, which is 2, giving us 5. We'll add that to the memo table as well, just for completeness. And then finally, the result of this call is going to be the Fibonacci 5 number that's in our memo table, and we're done. So we've saved a significant amount of redundant calculation by using this dynamic programming. It came at the expense of a little bit of storage space, uh, but in this case, this was a good trade-off. If we're calculating a really big Fibonacci number like Fibonacci of 30, um, that can take hours to calculate on a computer using the naive recursive algorithm, and it can take just a few milliseconds to calculate on a computer using the dynamic programming algorithm. And we're only going to need an element, a list that has, uh, you know, 31 numbers in it. So that's not a very significant increase in storage requirements. All right, so if you're interested in algorithms, this is something that kind of was interesting to you. Uh, I found this video uh, online posted very recently about a pretty famous problem in CS, similar to the knapsack problem. Uh, the traveling salesman problem, TSP, 
and it talks about all the different ways that we solve it. So if you're interested in finding more about algorithms and the whole idea of the theory of computer science is interesting to you, uh, you can learn a little bit more about this just by watching a simple YouTube video. All right. So anyway, that's it for today. And in the next one, we'll do a demo or we'll write up some of these algorithms uh, and uh, in Python and see how they work a little bit more. We'll see you next time.